I want to share this with you that somebody sent me in case somebody's interested in seeing this particular film. Uh, This individual said, I was led by the Father to see this documentary movie this past Tuesday evening. He added, I never go to the movies, I was But this one was absolutely incredible. The true history of the beginning of our Christian nation, not the revisionist version of history, the enemies of America try to pawn off on us, this movie and the follow-up of it. It is a great start for an awakening across this land to the fundamentals that our original republic was built on and the need to get back to basics in order to regain the Republic again. The name of this movie is Monumental. Kirk Cameron, uh, I'm not sure if he produced it, but I think he did, or starring in it at least. Uh, There are several themes stressed as such. Number one, the true history of the struggles of the Puritan separatists in England and their eventual journey to America, they believe to be the new Israel. Isn't that interesting? The Mayflower Compact and the importance of self-government. I like that theme a lot. We've got to get back more to self-government than having federal uh, government. All right, the monument, Minds of of the Forefathers, is in Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts. It sets out a strategy for the nation, the principles or the formula of everything based on faith, along with morality, God's law, education, and liberty and freedom. Our founding forefathers were Christians, not deists, as revisionists would have us believe. Congress even paid for the printing of the Bible to be distributed to all schools as a textbook. And the evidence is presented by David Barton in this from uh, Texas, it adds. You owe to your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews to see this movie, to get the DV through the website. Share Monumental with your friends. So I'm just letting everybody know right now. So it's not a major uh, studio distribution? No. no. So um, uh, that's a bit of good news today in Passover time. Amen? Well, I'm not sure the, let me, yes I can, it is on here, excuse me. The uh, website is www.monumental, M-O-N-U-M-E-N-T-A-L, movie, M-O-V-I-E, it's all one word, dot com. Monumentalmovie.com. I don't know if it's available on DVD right now or not. It may be, but it, and then again, it may be at the theater somewhere. I'm not sure. But I will definitely be uh, looking that up. All right, we're going to enter now into uh, communion service. Uh, Michelle, do you have someone to help you there? Okay. Um, I'll have you come up in just a minute. Uh In our next newsletter that is coming out, I've included an article by a friend of mine. His name is Alan Newton. Alan and I were what you might refer to as roommates on our last trip to Canada when we went fishing. And I found out that he is a uh, scholar, or what I would call a Hebrew scholar. And he knows a lot about Hebrew meaning Hebrew words, and uh, he's very good at putting different things together in Hebrew. He sends me things from time to time, and he sent me this particular article called Thoughts on Communion. I would encourage you to get the newsletter in the back of the room and to read the whole article on Thoughts on Communion by him. I do not have time to go into all of it, but I will share parts of it with you in this communion because I like it, and I thought it might add to our understanding of communion. It it deals mainly with this Hebrew word, bazar, B-A-S-A-R, which really means flesh. 
He quotes Isaiah 52, verse 7, which says, quote, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, thus saith, I mean, that saith unto Zion, Thy Lord God reigneth. He says the Hebrew word translated good tidings in this verse is also the Hebrew word bezar. And he says, wow, what a revelation. How beautiful is he that brings his bezar. Now remember, that means also flesh. Or good news to the mountains or the high places. This changed me instantly, he added. I had previously understood Bezar as flesh, but now I could see that flesh was actually that part of my presence that was beneficial and desirable to others. No single concept of Hebrew has changed me more dramatically. He goes on to explain this by adding this scripture verse in Isaiah 61.1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings, Bezar again, unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, obviously from that it gets a little more interesting as you start thinking about this more and more. In John, and if you want to, you can turn there, John chapter 6, verse 48. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him, give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Uh, That is interesting, what we're reading there. And he says that Jesus, Yahshua, is trying to teach his people that eating his flesh is actually identifying with his quality of life remember him telling philip he adds in philip uh, chapter 14 if you have seen me you have seen the father that those are powerful words think about it can you imagine jesus telling you that if you're standing in front of him if you've seen me you've seen the father Yeshua is describing a quality of character or of the presence that we have been longing for but couldn't identify He's telling us to eat his flesh and to drink his blood as identifying with his life in us. Communion is really a common union. It is truly us identifying with the Son of God and by doing so, becoming sons of God. The subject of the sons of God has always fascinated me spiritually. And and there are many, many verses on it, perhaps In today's message, we will get into some of those verses as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27, he states, Moreover, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Allen states, when we ritualistically or religiously partake of communion, and we do not understand that what we are doing in this pageant is identifying that Yeshua's body is now our body, we are guilty of unworthily worthily dis- discerning that we are now the body of the resurrected Christ. His bazar, or flesh, has now become our Bazar. We are now the Bazar of God, the body of Christ. So, in communion, this has to do 
with changing our identity. So when we are partaking of communion, we need to do so with the understanding that we are partaking of his identity. Uh, He goes and explains this in deeper uh, detail. How do we know each other, though, today? We know each other, you may not like this term, but really is quite appropriate, in the flesh. Jesus said, I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood, did he not? Well, flesh is not important. Why should we bother eating his flesh or partaking of his flesh? I'm not getting Catholic on you that it's in a literal sense, but it's in this ritual, in this spiritual ritual, we learn more and we take on more the identity of Christ. And we are to take on the Lord Jesus Christ, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the scriptures tell us. Amen? So let's partake of communion at this time uh, with this understanding. Um, go ahead and just um, let me uh, let me add a, a prayer for it at this time. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your body, the body of Christ, and we pray that through this lesson here that we will grow in in uh, understanding of the great spiritual significance of your body and your precious shed blood. We want to take on the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to take on that identity because you've told us that we are part of that body, the body of Christ. And in that, there are many spiritual, powerful spiritual principles that are involved in this so-called ritual of communion. May we grow in that understanding. May the power of your Holy Spirit fill us today as we partake of this communion in remembrance of who you are and let us in the same uh, manner remember who you called us to be and that we are to be part of your body. So Lord Jesus, as we partake of communion, we are partaking of you and we want to become like you. We want to be part of your body. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen and amen. Now let us partake of this cup that represents his blood. He did something physical for us by dying upon the cross. We partake of something physical when we do communion. Now, we, I think, oftentimes like to spiritualize things, and that's good. It can be very good. Sometimes it can be bad if we go too far in spiritualizing things. Sometimes I think the gospel is taught in such a way that we spiritualize ourselves away into nothingness when he comes again and we just become invisible little ghosts running around, which is, uh, I mean, how do you become, if you're invisible, what's the point? But that's not how it really is. There is going to be, I believe, a physical return of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are going to be part of his body, and we are going to have a ministry. Certainly it will be spiritual, but it will also be physical. Even look at the new body that uh, that Jesus came back with. It was flesh and bone, was it not? Let's not forget that we're going to have a body. And we are going to be a part of his body, the body of Christ, his many-membered body. The power of the blood is going to be in his people, the sons of God. We're going to move on with our message today, which will be part 15 
on the uh, topic of declaring the Israel truth. Part 15. Uh, 15. Where do you get three? You're, you're, I said declaring the Israel truth. James, I'm through with James. That was part. That was part twenty. I've done twenty parts on that. So uh, she's uh, she's in she's in the heavenly of heavenlies or something. It, it, okay. Well, she does that just to uh, let me know she's not perfect. Sometimes she lets me know I'm not perfect. I'll tell you that right now. But she doesn't have to let me know that. I know. All right. Um, let's go to, to begin this, Luke chapter 2. I think these are worthy of us considering again. I can get over here. Luke chapter 2 and verse 29. Lo, now let thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people, Israel, the gospel of Christ to the nations, comes or has come from where? Certainly the light is Jesus Christ. Amen? We need that light. The world needs that light if it's going to come out of the darkness that it is in it will not come out of the darkness it is in thank god through the political processes today uh i like ron paul but it won't come to light through ron paul maybe a part of it he's certainly he certainly has more light than any of the other candidates by virtue of the fact that they're attacking him, awakens me to that possibility right away. If they're against something, the media is against something, perhaps I need to examine it a little bit more. Maybe what they are against, I would say 90-something percent of the time, is actually good for us. And I'll bet you if we could take the time this morning to write down all the things that the media is against. I mean, is the is media for prayer in school? Is the media for abortions? Is the media for a one world government? Is the media for, dare I say, race mixing? Is the media for sodomites and the sodomite lifestyle and, and humanism and communism? Go on down the line. In fact, does does the media support the concept that the Jews are God's chosen people? Absolutely they do. They they don't complain about that at all. There's no separation of church and state in that particular issue. But when we're looking at the people that God or the agents that God Almighty has used for the most part down through the ages to uh, be the missionaries of the gospel, God's servant people concerning the gospel. Did did the gospel of Christianity, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the missionary work of that come through the Jews? No. I'm not saying that Jews were not involved in some aspect of the Christian gospel. But per capita and by far, The Bible has come from the work and the labor of the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and kindred people. The missionary effort, the principles of Christianity, the inculcating of the kingdom principles that we have today did not come from the Jews. 
I'm not, obviously most people understand the fact they didn't come from the Chinese, didn't come from the Japanese, didn't come from any of the other people, but the true Israelites. I'm not talking about this subject to insult any of the other races. I'm talking about this particular topic and subject to bring out truth as to who bear the marks of Christianity. And I say Christianity because that's what the Bible is about. That's the direction that it's going. It has to go that way because it's the bringing forth of the Savior, Jesus Christ, the light to this world. And the scriptures say in Isaiah chapter 9 that this light was brought upon Israel. It, the word lighted upon Israel. Why would it do? Why would the Word of God tell us this? It's because that's whom this gospel truth was going to mainly come from. Whoever Israel, whoever the true Israel people are, the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christian, would be brought forth. Christian manifest upon that particular people. Well, what people bear the marks of Christianity? Mainly the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and kindred people. When we're looking at the concept and the understanding of who the Israel people are, that's the context in which I'm bringing this up in, I would venture to say if we could take away the false education, the false religion, the false teachings that are out there in lots of various aspects, and look at God's Word, read God's Word, look at the identifying marks of Israel that are in it, we would come to no other conclusion but that we are Israel. Therefore, if we are Israel, I bring this up again, because it bears repeating, wouldn't that not help awaken Israel even more so to who they are? Truly, God Almighty has had a remnant of people down through the ages that have always known who they are and remembered who they are. But there is an enemy out there in various forms that do not want Israel to awaken or understand their true biblical identity. They do not want the gospel of the kingdom to be lived, to be understood, because that would interfere with their God, which is their own carnal reasoning, their own self-exalted way, their own self-exalted um, opinion of themselves and who they are and their form of government. The one world government and whatever, you could say there are various forms of one world government. I would agree with that. But any one of them is antichrist in nature and purpose. They do not want to include Christianity in any, even a small little drop of it, because they know that that would be the leaven that would leaven them. But they also know that the leavening of their humanistic, carnal, antichrist philosophy would bring us down as well. They have to keep us carnal. They have to keep us in a flesh state of existence. Does that make sense to you? Imagine the light bulb is going off a little bit in some of you right now when you're here and they say, you know, they, they're constantly putting this lust. They're constantly promoting sex. They're constantly promoting the humanistic philosophy. They're, they're, they're promoting all these various fleshly ways, greed, lust, power. What's that? Sodomy, yes. It's all a part of it. Absolutely. They're promoting all these ways of the flesh. And they know that as long as they can keep us in the flesh, we have, we've lost the battle. Somehow we've got to come out of the flesh, as the scriptures tell us, and into the spirit. 
Because in the Spirit there's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness. Is there goodness in our world today? Very little. Very little. You look back on history, Israel's been in bad situations. And it looks like all hope is lost for them. But there has always been a remnant, as I said earlier, that have they have known who they are. And they have pursued the God's way. Yahweh's way. Christ's way. They are the people of the way. We are known today as Christians. Anybody that does not like the term Christian needs to re-examine their thinking very strongly. Because we are the people of the way. And we are known after Him, meaning Christ, the name Jesus Christ. has There is power in that name. No matter what anybody may tell you, my dear friends, there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And again, we are not known as Yahweh's today. We are known as Christians. That is not an insult. That is something great that we need to be proud of. There is a righteous pride, a biblical pride we can have in that calling. Because if we understand that name in its fullness, in, it, in its all its, its, its uh, uh, spiritual awareness that is given to us in the Word... We would, the light would go on as to who we are. The more we have an understanding of our Christian history, our heritage, our biblical heritage, the more light will grow within his people, and this darkness that is upon us will be removed. I want to give you something a little, just something to think about here. You stop and you think about all the various superheroes that are written about in the comic books. Do you realize that is a form of identity? It is a form of people crying out for the sons of God. Superman. Da 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 da. What? Superman can do anything. You can't kill Superman, except for this kryptonite, right? Superman represents, for the most part, good values. Superman loved his parents. Superman protected his mom and dad. Superman was a good country boy. Superman learned to be honest Not to lie, not to cheat, not to steal, but to have good values. You go on to all the various different ones out there. Even the Green Lantern, you know. Batman, in a sense. All these are worldly attempts of the creation or the creature crying out for goodness. But they won't turn to the Word of God and Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate Superman, who will save this creation, who has the power to do that. But not only that, they don't want the sons of God to awaken to their true biblical identity and that they can bring about good And they can bring about various forms of salvation through the truth by living the truth, by walking in the truth, by being the sons of God that they are called to be. Taking on His identity, putting on the mind of Christ. They don't want us to do that. I'm not one to sit around and wait for the world to wake up. I think it's high time, yea, more than high time, that the sons of God start awakening. That the sons of God start reading God's word, believing God's word, walking in that truth. You can say, well, pastor, just tell me what to do right now. You know, that's something spiritual. 
listening to me, I don't know if I'm going to get this point across. I may utterly fail, but I'm going to try. It is something deeply spiritual that can only be given to you by the power, by the leading and the power of the Holy Spirit as to when, how, and why. But it will come upon you. It may come upon you most likely in steps that we take as a Christian people. Doors will be open and you become more comfortable with that. It's just like an age, and we were talking about the age factor, and when uh, you are, um, when you're a little child, you have fears. When you become a teenager, you kind of outgrow so many of those fears. But new fears come upon you, and you're still displaced. You're still uh, Wound, wound up like a tight rubber band, spiritually ready to explode, or, or emotionally, excuse me, emotionally and physically ready to explode. There's a lot about life you don't understand, even though when you're 18 years old, for some miraculous th- way, you think you know better than your parents and everybody else. And you soon find out, wow, I don't have a clue. And I thought my parents were so stupid in this area and that, in that area, I understand now what they were talking about. I understand the problems that they were going through. I understand some of the concepts they were trying to get over to me, but I was just too bullheaded to listen. I had to find out my own way. But when you get into, let's say, the 30s, you kind of calm down in 40s. doesn't mean you don't have any fears or anxieties, but things get a little bit better for you. As, but it takes time to grow, does it not? And you don't freak out as easily when you were young and worry about things that, I mean, when you're, when you're uh, 30, 40 years old and you look back on things you used to be fearful of and up, upset about when you were 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, you kind of laugh at those now. And you say, if you just would have had patience and time, And forgot a lot of these stupid things that they were involved in. But, strange enough, God created us to actually many times go through that stupid period. That ignorant, childlike period. Those growth pains that we have to go through of whatever sort and variety they may be. But, do you see this, this, this cry of, of help, even in the comic books and the, these characters there, this cry for help that is in the creation, yet they will not turn to the true Savior, Jesus Christ. How odd. How, how apropos of the flesh, is it not? I wonder oftentimes if we could have Jesus appear, and then create a super, Superman to appear. What would the world cry for? Would they understand the greater salvation that is there for them? <clears throat> you see, Jesus has a plan called the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, to just give you a little bit more of a vision here, reaches out to ultimate salvation through ultimate salvation living. He's going to restore this creation. He's going to bring it out of this state of hell and to deliver it into the glorious liberties of the children of the sons of God. Isn't that what the scriptures say in Romans chapter 8? We are going to be a part of, we are going to be his supermen, super children, super sons of God, that are going to be involved in this wonderful blessing That is going to come upon this earth. Jesus did not create us to escape this earth. I'll veer off a little bit of the subject here. That I met somebody yesterday. I will not mention their name. And I haven't seen them in quite a while. And uh, this individual believed the Israel message but really wasn't quite schooled in. It didn't really go much to, if any, to uh, Israel-believing churches or listen to sermons. 
there's a big difference between hearing some patriot version of what we believe and actually going and getting a full biblical education that doesn't stop. It gets ongoing. We are learning and growing to the day we die. But if you come and you hear a few patriot sermons on what we believe, I want to assure you, you have no very little concept of what we believe and what we're all about. And he is going to, uh, let's say, a certain Judeo-Christian church. Now, and again, I haven't seen him in quite a long time. And I said, uh, please tell me you're not believing certain things. He says, well, that's interesting. We'll have to talk about that. I said, well, please tell me, you don't, at least tell me you don't believe in the rapture. He smiled, he says, well, we'll have to talk about that. (laughs) And I thought to myself, isn't that interesting? That they could start believing the rapture doctrine. How could they believe this escape rapture? When the Bible is very clear that Christ is coming, he's going to establish his kingdom on earth, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Lots of scripture verses on that, that the kingdom is going to be here, there's a great work for us to do, we're not escaping off into the heavens, and the earth is going to burn up and become nothing, the earth is going to become something great the likes of which King Solomon's kingdom would be very, very jealous of. I imagine if we were looking at King Solomon's temple and could see the glory of it, we would be jealous of it right now, would we not? But yet, when we look and we understand the glory and we get a vision of that kingdom, and we start seeing true justice, true equity, true love, true uh, governmental harmony where everything harmonizes with the divine creator and his plan of the ages. I can't imagine such things where we will not have injustice anymore, but we will have true biblical justice, true righteousness upon this earth. Doesn't that make your heart shout? It does to me. I look forward to that day. And perhaps that's part of the problem. We don't have enough teaching on the greatness and the glory of his kingdom that is to come. Therefore, without a vision, the people perish. And maybe we are perishing as a people today because we don't have a biblical vision of the kingdom of God. We don't have a biblical vision of really entering into his rest and having that biblical spiritual rest. Because we have no flesh hanging over us at that time. We are not brought down by the fleshly ways of man anymore. But righteousness, true biblical freedom and liberty reigns and it is everywhere throughout the land. You don't have to lock your doors at night. You don't have to wonder about your children. People say, I don't know if we're going to have children in the kingdom. Well, I'm not totally sure of that either. But I'll tell you right now, if we are, I'm not going to have to worry about them. I'm not going to have to worry about the uh, wolves and the lamb or the lion and the sheep, etc. Understanding, as George has brought out, about those are, or those are Israelite symbols of banners of Israel that are, have many spiritual applications concerning them. But there's also the aspect of peace, that there will be harmony in the kingdom of God. Don't you look forward to that? Things have to be done in their right order and in their right place. The scriptures bring this out. There is a tremendous amount of order in the scriptures if we will just take our time to understand it, what it's telling us there. And uh, uh, to me, it's indisputable. When we're looking at this social message and what it's really telling us, and uh, and it is 
a key part of the gospel. When you're looking at Christianity, I'm going to say it again, because I've told you this before, true biblical Christianity points to true Israel. Now, some people, some group of people, is called to be Israel. We've gone over that. But it is so true. It is. Then what people are called to be his people? Then we have to look at, if we're confused on that, the identifying, biblical identifying marks of Israel. And obviously, one of the main ones is that they would be Christian. Now, people will not like this that are in the Judeo-Christian world, but the Jews do not bear that mark. Oh, but pastor, I've heard about so-and-so, they converted to Christianity and they were Jewish. Maybe they did. God bless them. Hope they stay Christian. Hope they'll really live Christian. But when we're looking at a people that bear the marks of Israel, they do not fit the Jews or the Jewish nation. It is an anti-Christ nation. You cannot look at the banner, the symbols, the government, what it is today, and say, wow, what a Christian symbol, what a Christian light is coming forth from Israeli Palestine today. Quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. Oh, but Pastor, you can't look at America and say that anymore. You could at one time in America. But what happened in America? Why why were we Christian, and I guarantee you know as well as I do, that Even 100 years ago, 200, 300, 400 years ago, you could look to the United States of America and said, Wow, the Christian light is almost blinding. People are Christian. They have Bibles. Everything they do and represent and where they get their understanding of politics and government and economics comes mostly from the Word of God. It was Christian, Christian, Christian. I mean, we have changed Something has happened along the line to change that. We were. Right? I don't need need a response, but we were Christian. What happened? We were deceived. We did not adhere to what the warnings of the scriptures that I'm not going to go over today, but we there's plenty of them, and you know them, about false shepherds. Sins of omission, sins of commission, I don't care how it came about. Let's just say it was totally by accident, which I don't believe, really. It was through greed, corruption, They sold out the Lord Jesus Christ just like, just like who? Who? Judas. Judas. Thank you. Did he sell out the Lord Jesus Christ? For 30 pieces of silver. I imagine there's a lot of them that sold out for even less than that today, if we understood it, what they were doing. But some... Someone or some system or some philosophy was used to get them over to the dark side. Now we could go over, well, yeah, man, there was greed. Maybe there was power. Maybe we'll make you a professor. Or we'll give you this land. Or we'll give you something. We will we'll take care of you if you will do such and such. Maybe it was the other way around that if you don't do it, we'll take care of you and we will kill you. Or we'll do something. There's lots of various ways to get to people, isn't there? But we need to be a people that say, whether I live or whether I die, I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to do things His way. I'm not going to sell out my heritage. I'm not going to sell out my race. I'm not going to sell out the faith. I'm going to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. May that, those words, be upon my tombstone. Now, 
But Christianity has been corrupted. Christianity has been infiltrated. And I say that because we need to understand that. So I'm going to say it again. To wake some people up. Dear friends, Christianity has been infiltrated. Oh. Oh. Oh, I see what you mean now, Pastor. Christianity has been infiltrated. Yeah, that's what I mean. By an enemy, and we could refer to them as terrors. Now I'm going to give you a warning or insight that the Word of God has already given us. I wonder who this enemy is, Pastor, that's doing this to us today. It's very clear who's doing it to us today. They are the terrors. The Bible said these enemies of Christ, they, their heads would rise up in the end. The terrors are lifting their head today, and all you have to do is look at them, look at their fruit, their ungodly fruit, the things that have come out of their mouth, their actions, their motives, what they're doing to destroy our nation, to make this an antichrist nation in every way that they possibly can, to bring us down. They are the ones that are doing it. But they had been hidden before. You couldn't really see them. But now, they're raising their heads. Because it's getting time for the harvest. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom, that's good news. The kingdom is coming. I, um, I want to go over a, uh, a uh, few verses with you on this. Um, actually, when I look at this and the amount of time that I have, I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I'm just going to save it for uh, the next time and get into, because it's going to get a little bit lengthy, what I want to discuss with you. But I do think it's important that we get our minds and our hearts around this concept of the kingdom of God. And I've said it, A thousand times, I will say it, hopefully, many millions of times before I pass on. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Israel has got to start seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Israel, when they start doing that, will literally get their eyes open to the enemies that are out there and what the enemy has done to us. There's lots of verses, for instance, for fear of the Jews, they wouldn't do this. For fear of the Jews, they wouldn't do that. Because, why? (laughs) Now, what might that fear be of the Jews? Well, there's really no end to the wiles of the enemy. There's many destructive ways they can get to you. But if they can use you as useful um, idiots. (laughs) I was going to come up with a different term, George, but that's a pretty good one, useful idiots. And a lot of people are. And you look at their lifestyle, you look at the way they talk, you look at the way they live, they sound like idiots today. They have become, and you can look at them and say, wow, they become useful idiots to the enemy. When you become students of the Word of God and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ignorance starts leaving you. You become wise. Well, our forefathers, again, used to be very wise people. When you look at the Christians and what they thought and what... I mean, look at the Apostle Paul. How many of you can read what the Apostle Paul says and think, that guy's an idiot. He hasn't got an intelligent concept in his brain at all. I've never read the Apostle Paul and thought that at all. Right? I've always thought, man, that guy's deep. He's deep. He's got, he is a serious student. Think about this. Well over 2,000 years ago. But for thousands and thousands of years, our race has had very intelligent people as a part of it. 
That all comes about when you start studying our origins and get a true understanding of our, our history and our heritage and, the, and, and, and who we really are. The, the world wants us to think we are all the same. That we were all swinging around on the, in the trees acting like a bunch of apes. Not true. Some people may very well have been doing that, but we have not. Yet, when we deny the Lord Jesus Christ and we shed our identity, we become as the world. We become a lower species. And we can actually become like brute beasts. Don't tell me that sodomites and their lifestyle is not like that of a brute beast. Don't tell me that they won't sell out their heritage and our people in a heartbeat and have already. Anybody, I wasn't planning on ending my sermon this way, but hallelujah, I'm doing it. Anybody that puts their trust in a faggot and a sodomite, you're, you're dumber than dumb. Because they will sell you out. That's part of who they have become. There are strong reasons, biblical reasons, why the Word of God told us to watch these people. Beware of these people and what they do. Because they're dangerous to our Christian heritage. They're dangerous to our nation. And if you let them keep growing and keep giving them power and special status and special rights... By the way, they're throughout our our military right now. I've warned our people in the military, get out of the military. Please, get out of the military. Until we start changing and living more righteously and develop a righteous military, the righteous people get kicked out. I'm not saying General Patton was a man that walked on water by any stretch of the imagination, but he was far more godly than what people think that he was. And they hated him because he knew who the Bolsheviks and the communists were. And he recognized what they were going to do to destroy our nation, and they wanted to get rid of him. I have no doubt in my mind they killed him. No doubt in my mind. Would George Patton have put up with sodomites in the military. Not one second. Not one second. What kind of leaders are these mamsy pamsies, four-star generals in the Pentagon, hugging the president? All right, president, this is a great idea. We want to invite more sodomites in. We want to take all the restrictions away from you, them. You gutless, ungodly, Morons. What is going on in our nation that would allow that? Seriously, folks. Is our nation in trouble? Yes. In lots of different ways. And I have a feeling in this godly fear, we may, uh, we may have Obama for four more years. And we, we, better, we better start praying. God deliver us from that guy. I know Bush was just as bad, but I think we need to pray for Arpaio and get free somehow. Who? Sheriff Arpaio. Oh, Char- Sheriff Arpaio. Yeah, he's fighting that guy every, and they're fighting him every step of the way. But uh, and there's godly people out there. Oh man, that's a great point. Pray for godly people to rise up. Pray for godly people to run for office. Pray for godly people to get involved. Yes, God's spirit to move and set our people. That's what will help set our people free. I don't mean to gloat over Patton any. I mean, you know, it's just me. uh, But we need bold men and bold women even today that will stand on Christian faith, Christian principles, and not live in fear of the enemy. That's what's holding us back. We got the fear of the Jews in us, and we got to get rid of that. Well, I'm going to have to close. I I uh, appreciate 
uh, you uh, taking the time to listen to these messages. Again, I pray that these messages I'm giving you here on declaring the Israel truth, I hope, I hope parts of it are hitting you hard and awakening you. And I especially pray for young people that it's awakening them. Those of you families that are getting these messages, Please do your best to get these in the hands of your young people. If you feel the Spirit meeting, uh, leading you in something I'm saying here, that you feel they need to watch, please set them down. Make them a hot fudge Sunday, whatever you can to get them a sit down and watch this. Or you say, oh, I don't, that's, that's, that's bad, 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 blowing food. Okay, make them a green drink. Give them some barley green juice or something. Give them a banana, whatever, you know. Pro. <laughs> Give them a big kiss and, 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 and uh, tell them you love them. But get them to sit down and watch some of these things to get truth, biblical truth, into their hearts and minds. You know, it isn't going to be long that it's going to be theirs. This world, what are they going to do? I do not, boy, I'm going over time here. I do not see a sense of urgency within a lot of these young people. I watch them that supposedly know... When I was young, and I watched young people that were growing up learning this, they were on fire for it. We've got to get that fire of the Lord back in our lives again. That means get true biblical understanding.